Stepping back in time to hear firsthand about the initial and long-term devastation caused by the invasion of sea lampreys into the Great Lakes. Years ago, GLFC Communications Director Dr. Mark Gaydon knew time was running out to collect oral histories relating to the sea lamprey invasion. He wanted to hear from anyone and everyone who had a connection with these creatures, from past commercial fishers to current sea lamprey researchers and everyone in between. Knowing this project would be no small task, Dr. Corey Brandt, a recent PhD graduate from Michigan State University, who had been working with sea lamprey pheromones for nearly seven years, was brought on board to tackle the job. What started as a two-year project quickly became a longer endeavor. But the end results? A book, a documentary, and invaluable memories and firsthand accounts of unforgettable experiences that will now be recorded forever. The official project title is An Oral History of Those Affected by and Charged with Controlling Sea Lamprey in the Great Lakes Basin. From 2015 to 2019, Corey toured the Great Lakes Basin, talking to people and recording their stories to learn about the personal and professional effects the sea lamprey invasion had on people who lived and worked in the Great Lakes Basin. Sometimes he went alone, and sometimes with professional videographer Lindsay Haskin, historian Mark Gaydon, and even myself. Why are oral histories important? To explain this and give more information about the project, I'd like to introduce Corey Brandt himself. Thanks for joining us this week, Corey. Hello, thanks for having me. This project became a huge part of my life over the past few years, and I enjoy any opportunity to talk about it. Why are oral histories important? Well, without them, pieces of history are lost. As older generations pass away, their first-hand stories vanish with them. By capturing these stories on video or through audio recordings, we can preserve them, learn from them indefinitely, and share them with the public. For the Sea Lamprey Control Program specifically, many current and future employees wouldn't have the chance to truly understand the devastation caused by the initial Sea Lamprey invasion. While reading a fact sheet or talking to other people who are part of the program can tell some of the story, nothing compares to a first-hand account from back in the day. Hearing a person describe their thoughts when first laying eyes on a blood-sucking sea lamprey, or listening to one of the original technicians explain what it was like to test over 6,500 chemicals during the huge effort to discover a successful lamprecide is vastly more impactful. The products from this oral history project will not only benefit the general public, but also researchers that want to learn about past changes to the Great Lakes fishery. And of course, the control program itself will benefit by learning from its past to inform future sea lamprey control employees. Thanks so much for joining us, Corey. One more point I'd like to make before we watch a couple clips from Corey's research is that while this project had many neat moments along the way for Corey, it also included a countless number of hours sorting through audio and video clips all of which had to be transcribed and then coded based on different themes, such as fisheries politics, the evolution of trapping techniques, and even concepts such as the motivation to never give up. This was no small feat, given that over the course of the project, Corey recorded more than 100 hours of audio clips and video footage. Sorting and cataloging the footage will allow us and future historians and researchers to find this information more easily. While Corey was not alone in the process, it is not an exaggeration to say that for the past three years of his life, he ate, slept, and breathed this oral history project. We are so fortunate to have this work near completion and appreciate Corey's dedication to the project. And now, without further delay, let's watch some clips. It scared the living tar out of me. And I remember them being so slimy. <laughs> slippery. You started seeing them on the side of the fish. Yeah. You didn't see the, them per se, but they were, you could see they were marked on the trout that we used to get. 
happened, so we knew something was happening. I can remember my dad, I was only four, but I can still picture my dad sitting at the table telling us about the lamprey coming into the Great Lakes, and he kept telling us that it was going to be an evil thing. He would remind us that no live lamprey would go back into the water if it came up in our nets. I talked to a lot of commercial fishermen, like there used to be in my day, there was in Lake Superior especially. That was their livelihood, that's the only thing they had, and they were really worried. They were worried because it had uh, devastated the fishing on Lake Huron and Lake Michigan. Yeah, we did, really didn't know what they were. There's just lots of them. Every place you look, there's one hanging on a fish, you know. Nobody, nobody really knew what they were until after they hit, you know. Then everybody got educated in a hurry. I didn't know at the time that they would get so overwhelmingly bad as they did because they almost wiped out the, the fishing. All this commercial fishing, you know, at the time it ended, it was blamed on the lamprey. I'd go over and talk to the fishermen once in a while and they were just about out of business. Things were really, really bad. Towards the end, some of the fish were so badly marked in the net that they couldn't sell them to the buyers. And the people that you were selling them to in Detroit and Chicago and New York, they didn't like them all chewed up. You know, we were fishing is no good anymore. We're not getting anything. We got to fold our business up because there's just nothing to catch. You know, you could tell from that that it was quite a disaster, really. They started with, with mechanical weirs, just screens. And yeah, they worked, but they clogged and logs come down and punch holes and things. And, all that stuff. So they then went to a, uh, straight AC electrical barriers. And that's that's the original control. The real work was done back in the 50s. I mean, you can talk about all the other stuff that's going on. The backbone of this program is chemical control. I mean, the, the, the work that Vern Applegate and Cliff Corpman, Cliff Corpman weighed every single one of the 6,000 plus chemicals they tested here. Every single one. We started in 49, the summer of 49. Uh, Dr. Muff and them were talking about it and they said we had to come up with a chemical that would kill the sea lamprey without harming the fish. Just about every fish you caught in the lake we had a scar on it. And a f sucker about that long it took them about 13 hours to kill it. Of the 6,000 chemical plus chemicals that they tested, they tested all but two. 6,700 and some, I think it was. 5209 was the one we found with TFM. They call it TFM now. It worked right off the bat. The minute we start pumping the chemical into in the little billies there, the uh, MSC started floating up. For those interested in more information, Corey's book, titled Great Lakes Sea Lamprey, The 70-Year War on a Biological Invader, was released in the fall of 2019. And be on the lookout for the documentary on public broadcasting stations. This project was made possible through a partnership between the GLFC, the University of Michigan Water Center, and the University of Michigan Press. What would happen if, if we did away with it? Um, well, you could probably guess whatever, what lake trout are out there to buy. When the TFM was discovered, um, then, you know, that, that really, made a difference. Yep. People thought they were like like um, horrible creatures from the bottom of the earth, you know, because they were so unfamiliar to us. We hadn't seen that kind of a thing come out of the water before. Yeah. The first one I saw was in a pickle jar and it had sucked down to the side of the glass with its big ishy mouth, you know. It was just unbelievably bad. Yeah. You know?